Well, hi there, and welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. And on behalf of Alice, Mark, and myself, we want to greet you in the precious, the wonderful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, today we're going to be studying from the book of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. So you may want to turn to there. And I, I do want to recommend, as I have often, that you have something to write with, make, make notes to yourself, make notes of things you want to check on, make things that you want to look up later, questions that you might have. And you're always welcome to contact us by email with any questions or comments at office at BibleTalk.com. And we'd love to hear from you. Yes, we would. <laughs> so do it. Do it. All right. Father, we just thank you, Lord God. We thank you for every word in your word that you have provided to us. Because as Paul wrote to Timothy, they're all God-breathed and life-giving. They're profitable in our lives, Lord, profitable for, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, mm -hmm. things that we need, Lord. So, Lord, I just pray that you would open the eyes of our hearts, Lord God, that we would see wonderful things in your word today. You, Lord. Lord, help us to grow in you, to be more like you, Lord, for the glory of your name, Father. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. All right, I want to start by saying that the church at Ephesus, the city of Ephesus was one of the most important cities in the Roman Empire at the time of the New Testament. Okay, it was, it was a crossroads to the empire between the western part of the empire and the eastern part of the empire and the southern part. All right? So people, it was, it was so common for people to cross, their, their lives would pass through Ephesus, Ephesus at one point or another. And, of course, the city of Ephesus was known above all for one of the wonders of the world in the time of the New Testament. And that was the Temple of Artemis, or Diana, as she was known in Rome. Basically the same goddess, same false goddess. <laughs> they had a lot of different gods in that Ephesus. They had a lot of different gods in the Roman Empire, throughout the Roman Empire. But there's a hierarchy to the gods. And, and uh, Artemis, or Diana, was considered to be, I think, the twin sister of, oh gosh, one, I, my memory is not what it used to be, one of the important gods of the hierarchy of ancient gods. Okay. I, if I think of it, I'll let you know. Or you can always go on Google and Google it, all right? But the point is, this was, as I say, one of the wonders of the world. This was one of the biggest, most important pagan temples throughout the Roman Empire. And because Ephesus was a city of commerce and this crossroads to the empire, this is one of the reasons that it was so important and why it was so effective as a tool that God used when the gospel took hold there, because the gospel spread from there wildly all right um now it's interesting that the temple had been built for centuries before the roman empire even came into existence it was probably first inhabited by the hittites you know the hittites hittites mennonites mennonite no not mennonites <laughs> not the bingoites not the okay <laughs> Right? And it was and, and had it was an exceptional part of the Roman Empire because it was self-governing. That was one of the rewards for Ephesus, that it had the power to govern itself uh, with less influence by the Roman law, right? Because it was such a tourist attraction, I mean, people, I, and I use that term loosely, I mean, I, I don't think they would have thought of it as a tourist attraction. Yeah. But people <clears throat> flocked to Ephesus because of the Temple of Artemis. Mm -hmm. Kind of like Mecca today for the Muslims. Well, that's a well, requirement. I mean, yeah, then it would be like the Vatican, Vatican today. Well, I, I don't know if it's analogous to anything in particular. Yes. I understand what you're saying. Yeah. But people went there 
because yes, it, it was a like a re religious pilgrimage. I'll just say that, okay. But not one that was mandatory like Mecca, and not one that was. I'm not going to get into Rome at the moment, all right. But it was a free city, and that's an important fact. But they made so much of the income in the city was made from this from the people who were going there for these religious purposes. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that was the, uh, at the heart of the economy of Ephesus was the religious trinkets, right. the little, little shrines, yeah. little idols of Diana, yeah. Diana and, and Artemis, which becomes very important when you look at the scriptures mm -hmm. and understand why such a, an uproar occurred when Christianity started to take hold and people were turning their backs mm -hmm. on this trade, mm -hmm. right? Okay. Now they had other shrines. They had they had other temples and they had shrines to the Roman emperors, for example. It was very much a religious center. It was the destination of pagan pilgrimage throughout the Roman world. When I say it's a religious center, I th I don't think we have a grasp of the reality of what that meant two thousand years ago. Today. I, go, I mean, we, we just returned from a couple of months over in, in the UK, traveling and, and ministering. And, and here in the United States, with all that's going on, they talk about, you know, it's Christian foundation, which ain't necessarily so. Mm -hmm. But the point is that we look, I mean, I can, I can remember when I first got saved, looking at, uh, uh, I'm trying to think of some of the surveys that were done. And they were saying that Pew, Pew surveys and Barna surveys, and they were saying that uh, the United States had like 80% people in the United States believed in God. To which I always say, well, whoopee. Mm -hmm. Because in the Roman world, pretty much 100% of the people mm -hmm. believed in God. Right. Just not necessarily the right one. Mm -hmm. uh, most emphatically, not necessarily the right one. They believed in God's. But it was the, the scriptures that say in Psalms that only the fool says in his heart there is no God made a lot more sense 2,000 years ago because people didn't say there's no such thing as a God. Right. Everybody believed in a God, right. basically. Right. Unlike today, today right. is a unique time. Yes, it is. I, I think atheism is more of a, a thing in our world today than it ever yes. has been right. in history. That will change. Not necessarily for the better, but it'll change. Mm -hmm. Okay. They had games there. They were famous for games. You know how they had the games? Mm -hmm. not, not, I'm not talking about baseball or football no. or soccer or rugby. Like the races, chariot races. And I'm talking about the games with gladiators. Gladiators. They, they were blood, blood sports, right? Killing Christians. Well, yeah. They were, they were definitely killing Christians. But because of that, People also flock there because of the bloodletting, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Which still, I think, attracts people today mm -hmm. in so many of the sports, right? The other thing is that the, the temple, particularly the Temple of Artemis, was a haven for criminals. And it was a haven for prostitutes. Oh. For criminals because they, they could take refuge. Mm -hmm. Which, by the way, carried on into medieval times, okay? You know, if you could get into a cathedral. That was your sanctuary. That was your sanctuary. But that was very true back in, in these ancient days. And when I talk about prostitution, I'm talking about temple prostitution. Okay. Yeah. You know, that was, that was a very common practice. What a way to build a megachurch, eh? Mm -hmm. I'm not going to go there. So, none of these reasons were what brought a Jewish tent maker into town. A man by the name of Paul, a man who did not dwell under the shadow of the temple, but rather in the shelter of the Most High, mm -hmm. in the shadow of the Almighty, as it says in Psalm 91. Paul was there for a different reason. Right? So that's basically the historical background, and it's an, it's an important one. But there's also a very important biblical background to Ephesus. 
And I mean, you know, you can go into it actually appears so many times in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, in Galatians, in the, in the accounts of, of Paul, right? Because, but after Paul is saved and ministering, he left Corinth by way of Sancria, and he went to Ephesus. And it was around summertime in 53 AD. Now, that's almost 40 years before the next letter to Ephesus, which was John on the island of Patmos, which you were thinking of in the, in the beginning, right? Because that's another, uh, there's a second letter. There's two letters to Ephesus. Mm -hmm. We're looking at the one from the Apostle Paul. Mm -hmm. But there most assuredly was another one written to the church from Jesus Christ through the Apostle John, mm -hmm. right? But he was there, like so many people were, to make a connection in his travels. Mm -hmm. It was like, he, we're in Florida right now. If you want to go someplace in the United States of America and you're going to fly, you're going to go through Atlanta. Right. You're going to go through Dallas. I mean, these it's are like hubs. Yeah, it's a hub, right? Well, Ephesus was that tra kind of travel hub mm -hmm. back in the ancient world. Mm -hmm. So I'm just going to. So Paul went there and he spent some time and he stopped to reason in the synagogue, which was his practice mm -hmm. to the Jews, right? Mm -hmm. The companions who had left Greece with him, Aquila and Priscilla, remained on as he continued on in his journey. So sometime, not long after Paul's departure, an Alexandrian Jew named Apollos came on the scene. Now Apollos, if you've read the, about him in the book of Acts, he was known for his eloquence. He was a great speaker. And for his knowledge of scriptures and his zeal. Mm -hmm. However, he didn't seem to have an understanding of the working of the Holy Spirit. Right? This lack in his life was corrected by the ministry of Priscilla and Aquila. And it would appear at this point that he felt led of the Lord to tra travel to Achaia, where Paul and those friends had come from. It seems possible that both Priscilla and Aquila might have joined with him because it says, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul returned to Ephesus, this time by land, and it was evident upon him meeting the small group of disciples that were there now that they lacked the evidence of the Holy Spirit working in their lives. When he asked if they had received the Spirit, they informed Paul that they had not even heard of it. Right? Remember this in Acts? So Paul immediately took care of that, that deficiency. And trust me, if you don't have the Holy Spirit, it is a deficiency. So the power of God fell upon them and upon Ephesus, which, by the way, is a lot better than getting hit in the head by a rock falling from the sky. Mm -hmm. Now, why would I say that? Because in Acts 19, verses 34 and 35, it says, but when they recognized that he was a Jew, talking about Paul, right? A single outcry arose from them all, and they shouted for about two hours. Imagine this now. Strange. These people shouting for two hours. Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. After quieting the crowd, the town clerk said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there, after all, who does not know that the city of the Ephesians is the guardian of the temple of the great Artemis and of the image which fell down from heaven? Okay. So, I mean, this was, he's assuming that everybody in the, you know, the Roman world knew of this, okay? So, for the first few months, that that Paul, I mean, yeah, heck, I want to take a look at this. It, Paul spoke boldly of the kingdom of God in the synagogue, okay? When many there had hardened their hearts, in, inside, I'm talking about the Jews in the synagogues, Paul served the Ephesian church by teaching for the next two years at a rented facility. And it says this in the book Acts, the school of Tyrannus. The fruit of that work reached widely, widely throughout all of Asia. <clears throat> it wasn't an easy time for Paul, for while the, word, the Lord was working mightily in and through his life, the adversary threw his fiery arrows and otherwise threw up all over the place. This culminated in the near riot at the amphitheater, which held almost 25,000 people. Many who were being saved brought their junk, their trinkets, the things of their old life, and destroyed them. 
Paul's preaching, God's word, was having such an effect that business was falling off for the pornographers, the drug dealers of the day. Demetrius, one of the leaders of this group, stirred up his buddies in the rackets by reminding them of an important fact. Business is business. Oh. Now, that quote is attributed also today to many pagans and many Christians. After a couple of hours of shouting, trying to outvolume the word, since the devil being a dummy figure's quantity is always a good substitute for quality, the gathering dispersed. Paul then departed for the Macedonian churches. He had by then preached and taught them the whole counsel of God. That's what it says in Acts 20, 27. The city of Ephesus, though receiving an encouragement letter from Paul, would not see him again. All right, so let's look at his letter. Let's go into that. I'm going to go into it verse by verse. In Ephesians 1, 1, it says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God to the saints who are in Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. An apostle of Christ Jesus. Now, Paul was not an apostle of a particular church or a denomination, but of Jesus Christ. For Paul was a bondservant of Jesus, excuse me, representing the kingdom of God. And he had not chosen to take upon himself this ministry, but he had been chosen by the will of God. He was not self-appointed. You know, there's a lot of self-appointed ministers muscles, today. Yes, yeah. they are, they're, not, they're not only self-appointed, they is uh, anointed. So as the Lord said to Ananias, as he called him to seek out the man from Tarsus named Saul, who had just been, had the most radical encounter with Christ on the road to Damascus, God said to Ananias, go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the sons of Israel, for I will show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. Acts 9, 15 and 16. Now, it's a good thing for believers to desire to serve one another. Yes. Good. That's as close to an amen as I'm going to get. <laughs> but it says in 1 Timothy 3, 1, Paul had written there, it's a trustworthy statement. If any man aspires to the office of an overseer, it's a fine work that he desires to do. So yes, it's a good thing to desire to serve. Mm -hmm. But to serve, because the call to any ministry is a call to serve. And the key here is to have the mind of Christ. Which is, and he said, whoever wishes to be first among you, Jesus said, right? Mm -hmm. You shall, he shall be your slave, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Matthew 27, Matthew 20, 27 and 28. Now that's a fact that had become a reality in the life of Peter. I'm going to talk about Peter in just a second. Because Peter, who at first balked at the idea of Jesus washing him at the Last Supper, mm -hmm. right? Said, no, no, you can't wash me, right? <clears throat> when Jesus said, if I don't wash you, you're, you, you ain't getting there. It's, you, you won't be clean ever. So Peter then, in his exuberance, which he was known wash for, wash all of me, right? Mm -hmm. But Jesus did that as an example. Here is the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the King of Glory, bowing down and washing the feet of his disciples. Mm -hmm. And he did that as an example. So Peter would write later, as each one has received a special gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. 1 Peter 4.10. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm going to tell you something. And if you don't understand this, please go to your prayer closet and pray about it. If you are a believer, if you're a Christian, God has equipped you with a gift to use to serve others. Right. Not to serve yourself, yourself, but to serve others, okay? And it's important that you find out what that gift is, what that calling is, and that you fulfill your ministry. God will supply all you need to fulfill the ministry he calls you to. All right? For this, to the saints, and it goes on in this verse, in the first verse, to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. 
You know, there's always kind of a target audience in the Word of God. You realize that? Yes, it's right? being addressed to. It's being addressed to. Now, it's easy to say, well, God so loved the world. He did. He poured out his love for the entire world. But the Word of God is written specifically, oftentimes, specifically to somebody. Right. Not to everybody, all right? Exactly. So you need to find that out. Not everything is written to everybody, right. okay? So think about these verses. In Colossians 1, verse, chapter 1, verse 2, it says, To the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ. That's who that letter was written to. To the faithful brethren mm -hmm. in Christ. And then Peter himself wrote in, Peter, in 1 Peter 1.1, 1, 1, he says, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens. You know, we're supposed to be aliens and sojourners, strangers in a strange land, passing through this world. Don't get, don't get too settled in. And then in the letters of John, the third letter of John, he said, the elder to the beloved Gaius. Right. Now, I've said this a lot of times. That's one of the, I, that's a verse that is so, so misused. And, and because it goes on to say, you know, I pray that you prosper and be in health even as your soul prosper. But it was written to Gaius. Right. Now, I believe that if you have the same heart of Gaius, yes. who is known throughout the church for his generosity and his support mm -hmm. of other ministries, mm -hmm. God's going to have that same attitude towards you. Right. But if you don't have that, why would he pray that for you? Mm -hmm. okay. It's interesting because of the reputation that Gaius had, that God had somebody pray this specifically for him. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it's so important, and this is where you'll find another letter to Ephesus in the book of Revelation. Mm -hmm. It starts by saying that this is a revelation of Jesus Christ to show to his bond servants. Mm. To show to his bond servants. That's why I see in, 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 in our modern times, people writing books all about the last days and the book of Revelation and everything. If you're not a bond servant, if your life has not been sold and surrendered to Jesus Christ, to God the Father and Jesus Christ, that letter is not written to you. Right. And you'll never come to understand it. So this letter to the Ephesians is not to the perfect, but to the faithful. Mm -hmm. Because as Paul wrote to Timothy, all scripture is God-breathed and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. That's 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. That's who this letter is being written to, to the faithful, right? Mm -hmm. God the Father is the potter. We are the clay. And he is still molding, molding us. He is shaping us. He is conforming us into the image of his son, Christ Jesus. That's what Paul wrote in his letter to the Romans, right? You need to think. If you have trouble understanding the scriptures, one of the reasons may be that you're not you're not fitting into that category of people that it was written to. That when you just said that about the Lord still forming and working on us, that um, I think a lot of people use that as an excuse uh, because of the, the the where they are in Christ. I mean, in the level that they are, and that they they use it as an excuse not to to persevere and press on to go to the next level, so to speak. Go from line upon line, precept upon precept. And people use that as an excuse. Well, God's still working on me. But you know what excuses are. Yes, they are. I <laughs> do. They are the fiery arrows shot from the pits of hell to kill repentance. And repentance is about change. Change the way we think. To change the way we think. Yes. And that's exactly what God wants us to do. We have to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to be changed day by day. There's no excuse for staying stagnant. As a matter of fact, if you go and take time and read the first chapter of Zephaniah yes. and see what God thinks about stagnant. being stagnant or being settled on your leaves, as it says mm -hmm. in the King James. God loves you just the way you are. Right. And he loves you enough not to leave you just the way you are. Exactly. He has right. made a great promise to change you. And you better be open to that promise and better be looking for change in your life. Amen. It's our human nature to want to get comfortable where we are. If you're comfortable where you are, maybe you don't desire what's ahead quite enough. Exactly. Okay.
So I didn't mean to get you. Oh no, 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 no. That's 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 good. I, you know, we want we want this to be as interactive as we can make it. That's why I encourage you to write to us. If you have questions or comments, write to us at office at BibleTalk.com. I'll write next time. Alice is going to write next time. You need to write to us too. In the second and third verse of Ephesians chapter 1, it says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ. He's blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. See? Every. Yeah, everything. Unlike the Pharaoh of Egypt, who called the people of God to work, and then didn't refuse to equip them to the work, right, right. which was as evil as you could get. Mm -hmm. God will never call you to do anything that he doesn't he equip, equip you for, okay? Yeah. You, you need to understand that. So there's never an excuse, all right? Okay. What do you need to do to do what he calls you to? That's exactly right. <laughs> what you're going to say, the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what it takes to serve and fulfill the ministry that God calls you to. The great gift is, is in fact, is the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Because he was sent to lead us into all truth and provide his power working in us and through us. And you have to remember that because otherwise you might try and start do things on your own power. And you never really want to do that. Remember the seven sons of Sceva in Acts 19, 11 and on, I think verse 18. If you know that account where they were going to, they saw the, the power of the Spirit of God at work where the Christians were casting out demons and people were being changed instantly. And then what happens is, what happens? They try to cast out a demon. Mm -hmm. and they got beat it didn't go so well for them. It didn't go so well for them at all. Because they, the demon said to them, Jesus I know, Paul I know about, but who are you? And beat the living daylights out of them, all right? Don't try and do any ministry on your own. You have to seek the equipping of God, and he will equip you to do what he has called you to. Not necessarily what you would prefer to be doing, but believe me, what he calls you to is the thing that will bless you the most because he gives you every spiritually blessing in the heavenly places. By the will of God. By the will of God. Absolutely. We're going to talk about this more. I, mean, I don't want to rush through this too fast, but the fact is it is the Holy Spirit who will equip you yes. to first and foremost to be able to understand His the word. scriptures, the word of God. Mm -hmm. You know, People ask Jesus, the disciples ask Jesus, why are you speaking to these people in parables? They don't understand it. He said it's not given to them to understand. If you want to understand the word of God, it's not becoming a Bible scholar. It's not by going to the seminary. It is by getting on your face before God and, and opening yourself up to him and his work in you. And he will equip you. He'll give you exactly what you need to serve him, to serve others by serving him. Because that indeed is the call of God in our lives. So we didn't get very far, did we? Oh, because we yeah, can. Oh, no. But we're going to be back again next week, continuing on, and then we'll get more and more into the letter itself, all right? Okay. So, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for the faithfulness of the Apostle Paul, who went before us, Lord God. We thank you for the way he served you, because it's blessed us. Lord, I just pray that we would be open to all of your good work in our lives. You, we, we know that you've said you're working your will and your good pleasure in our lives, and we rejoice in that, Lord. So, Lord, mold us and shape us into useful vessels that will be used by you to glorify your name and draw people to you through the work of your Son, Jesus Christ. Well, until next week, God bless you. And goodbye. Bye bye. Thank Jesus, my Savior. Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your.